Welcome back for your, from your coffee break, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to get directly into the second session of the day that is dedicated to the review of uh, employment and social development in Europe. We're going to build uh, on what we started discussing before lunch, but if you were not at the previous session, it is not a problem because we're going to look more in detail at different aspects. This morning, we focused on the more general aspects of labor and skills gaps um, and shortages, especially in the light of the twin transition. This afternoon, we'll dive deeper into the challenges of labor shortages and the various drivers and also the relevant policies uh, and policy actions that could be taken that are needed to remedy those shortages. We will look more closely into the findings of the report, and we're very lucky to have with us two of its authors who really will take us through the various findings. Um, and we'll also have the chance to discuss a bit further with our panelists, whom I'm going to introduce after the presentation. If you have questions for our panelists, you're very welcome, welcome to send them through the chat function uh, of the platform if you're following us online, and there are quite a few people doing so. And we will give you the opportunity to raise questions from the floor as well. So prepare your questions. Our speakers, whether the co-authors or panelists, are happy to answer them. A quick word in case you were not in the session this morning and you would like to find the report online. If you look for ESDE Review 2023 in any search engine, you'll land right on it. So don't hesitate to do so. So as I said, to open our session, it's a pleasure to welcome two of the authors of this review. Please welcome Nora vukovic Votsi and Jakub Kaisel, and both of them are, are from the Director General Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion of the European Commission. And I think, Nora, you will take the floor first. So thank you very much to Florence for giving us the floor for the second session today focused on presenting the results of the 2023 Employment and Social Developments in Europe report, in short, ESDE. My colleague Jakob Seisel and I will be complementing, as Florence mentioned, the main messages that were discussed today in the morning session by focusing on the in-depth analyses of the report with regard to skills, working conditions, insufficient labor supply, as well as gender segregations as structural drivers of persistent labor shortages. Uh, to shortly recap for those of you who may not have been in the earlier session in the morning, this year's report presents, as every year, the main economic, employment and social developments in Europe, but this year has an in-depth focus on the analysis of structural drivers of persistent labor shortages and also showcases examples of policies uh, that might help identify, um, uh, might help mitigate these shortages. So in terms of the structure of our presentations, we will start off with by providing an overview of the report's approach to identifying persistent labor shortages and highlight specifically across which occupations these were identified. Secondly, we will then discuss the role of skills requirements and working conditions as structural drivers of persistent labor shortages. And we were glad to see that also in the Slido poll this morning, these were highlighted uh, by the audience as well. Thirdly, we will then look at the extent to which insufficient labor supply across different populations plays a role. And fourthly, we will showcase findings with regard to the segregated employment of women and men across shortage occupations. As I was also already just highlighted by Florence, we will look at, on the one hand, to what extent and in which occupations and sectors the identified listed factors were found to play a role in driving shortages, but we will also aim to present some of the policy options with regard to mitigating them. So to dive into directly the foundational analytical data work that underpins 
the report. Um, so in order to identify persistent labor shortages in the long term, so beyond those that are cyclically relevant, uh, we um, combined three different available approaches. Specifically, we collected data by the European Labour Authority, as well as uh, from our DG ECFIN, the Business Cons and Consumer Survey, and Eurostat's job vacancy rate. To arrive, you will see it on the slide here at a list of uh, 14 occupations at ISCO three-digit level and 16 sectors at NACE two-digit level uh, facing persistent labour shortages. In general, our analysis shows that shortages affect a diverse range of sectors and occupation. And as you will see on the diagram, they are mainly found in healthcare. And here they include both doctors, but also as well as uh, nurses and midwives, STEM, in particular ICT, construction and select service occupations. Overall, a main finding of the report is that the importance of different structural drivers of labor shortages significantly varies by occupation and sector. And we will now look further into what we mean by that by the before listed um, drivers of labor shortages. So to start off with the role of lacking specialist skills as a driver of persistent labor shortages, Firstly, our analysis shows that persistent labor shortages are found across all skills levels. And secondly, it finds that in general, based on set up analysis, and we're also happy to have a panelist from there uh, with us today, um, that labor shortage occupations require greater manual skills and lower digital skills as compared to non-shortage occupations. However, the report also finds that in some select occupations, limited supply of specific sp skills plays an important role. And in particular, this is the case in STEM and in healthcare occupations. For instance, uh, filling vacancies for ICT professionals is particularly challenging in several member states. And these positions require a high level of digital skills. And that being said, limited supply of high digital skills does not seem to be a key driver outside of ICT specialist work. So this is based on current and past data looking into the future. And this was also one of the main messages highlighted in today's morning session. Our analysis finds um, that the, the twin and digital transitions are projected to intensify labor and skill shortages, including by changing A, skills needs, and B, creating new jobs. In terms of uh, policies that could help mitigate shortages related to skills requirements, the report um, discusses select country evidence of um, counterfactual impact evaluations of training programs. And this is based on uh, a joint project we're conducting together with the OECD on counterfactual impact evaluations using administrative and survey data. Uh, based on the first results of the project, we show that upskilling and reskilling can have positive employment effects and help address persistent labor shortages in that way. So in the session this morning, we saw some of the results for Lithuania and positive employment effects for, found, uh, for participants of vocational training programs. We have here shown similar findings for Finland. Here we looked at self-motivated training programs in Finland, and we found, well, the, this is based on OCD work, and they were found to have positive employment effects uh, for certain groups. And in particular, um, they were found to have particularly large employment as well as earning effects for women, as shown by the red bar here, um, as well as older job seekers. Um, hence, dem demographic groups that were found to benefit the most from training programs are also groups that are typically underrepresented in the labor market. And this, in addition, points to benefits of activating underrepresented groups into training programs. Now moving on to the section of the report that looks, on, looks at the role of working conditions and employment conditions as structural drivers of persistent labor shortages. Here, our analysis in short shows that poor employment and working condition could explain the persistence of labor shortages in some shortage occupation. And here, our work is based on cooperation with Eurofound, and we analyze so-called job strain 
in persistent shortage sectors and occupations based on the 2021 European Working Conditions Telephone Survey. And job strain reflects six different dimensions of job quality. So the job quality indicator uses a methodology developed by the OECD that compares job demands, which affect workers negatively, uh, and job resources, which affect workers positively. And when workers have more demands than resources, they experience a poor job quality, or as we call it, um, higher job strain. And we, of course, have um, a representative from Eurofund as well in the panel today, uh, fortunately. Uh, so overall, we found that uh, job strain, shown by the cumulative bars uh, from, from the bottom to all the way to the top, um, at the end of the yellow bar, is substantially above the EU average, so to the left of the red bar that is shown here, among nurses, uh, carers, and drivers, but also service occupations, including cooks, uh, waiters, cleaners, and salespeople. On the other hand, job strain is found to be much below the EU average, so to the right um, of, the, of the red box here, for electrical workers and ICT-related occupations. Um, so we then looked at into dimensions of job quality that stand out for shortage occupations at the higher end of the job strain spectrum. And here we found that one of these factors that is particularly important is health and safety risks at work. Specifically, the report shows that amongst persistent shortage sectors and occupation, the highest levels of health and safety risks were reported for workers in the human health and care sectors as well as transport professionals. Specifically, over half of nurses, drivers, doctors, and carers reported health and safety risks in their workplaces. This is much above the EU average of 34%. Additionally, um, to job quality, the ESDA report also examines earnings or, as a proxy, difficulties in making ends meet. So earnings are not always included in the standard definition of working conditions. But uh, research has found that, of course, wages are correlated with workers' well-being and are widely considered a marker of job quality. So here, our analysis finds that several occupations characterized by persistent labor shortages reported an above EU average proportion of workers having difficulties in, working, in making ends meet. This was most, most notable for service occupations and, again, care professionals, and specifically, as you see by the red bars towards the end of this graph. Um, for cleaners, uh, over 40% of cleaners, cooks and bartenders and carers state that they have financial difficulties in making ends meet against the EU average of 26%. So as a very last step in our analysis on working conditions, uh, we wanted to better understand the role of employment and working conditions across different job profiles. So we triangulated three factors, job quality, difficulties in making ends meet, slash earnings, and contract types, so the share of uh, non-standard employment within shortage occupations. And we wanted to see how occupations and sectors fare across these three factors. So in short, and we start with the box on the left, shortage occupations experiencing two factors, namely higher than average job strain and above average difficulties in making ends meet, for workers in care, construction, transport, and certain service occupations. In the middle um, were shortage occupations experiencing three factors, namely higher job strain, lower earnings, and higher prevalence of non-standard contracts. And these were identified as a sector as a um, social and residential care, as well as security and services to building activities. So in the right box, finally, uh, on the other hand, occupations in STEM, in particular ICT, and engineering professionals were shortage occupations that had, on the other hand, lower job strain and higher earnings slash less difficulties in making ends meet. So that also brings me back to an earlier point in the presentation, which is that the lacking skills requirements are more likely as drivers of shortages in these occupations and sectors. So with these words, I give the floor to my colleague Jakub to take us to the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Nora. And I will jump straight into the next, uh, uh, next driver of shortages that we discuss in the report, uh, which relates to uh, uh, 
limits to labor supply in the, in the EU labor market, that is, limits to the number of workers available to fill positions in high demand. You have already heard this morning about the demographic projections, which are quite concerning in this respect, uh, uh, in terms of shrinking labor force in the EU. Here I'm going to focus on something different. I'm going to focus on uh, the limitations uh, to labor supply that we face today uh, for certain population groups, which is summed up uh, in this chart over here on the slide, which basically gives the effect of individual characteristics on uh, labor market participation probability in the EU over the last 15 years or so. And from the charts, you can see that there are a few groups that participate that have much lower probability of participation than other groups. The first group that I want to highlight here uh, is women. So for women, you have about 10 percentage points uh, lower probability than for men to participate in the labor market today in the EU. And this different gr difference grows by further 10 percentage points if you focus on mothers. Uh, the other groups that we highlight in the report are those, uh, are those uh, who have achieved at most a lower secondary education, so they are also much less likely to participate, and people who are aged 55 to 64. Here there is some role potentially for early retirement schemes. I would like to focus a little bit on the situation of women in the labor market because it's the broad broadest of these groups. Uh, it has a diverse uh, skill, skill portfolio also diverse age portfolio, so, it, uh, so there is potential to fill many labor shortages there. Uh, what I want to do is to give you uh, uh, an overview of how the participation penalties for women evolved over time. Uh, and I give it in these two slides. So the first slide shows that for women overall, the penalty, uh, for labor market uh, penalty in labor market participation decreased over time. It decreased particularly between 2004 and 2012, remained roughly steady since. Quite interestingly, in the bottom chart, you see that the penalty associated with motherhood actually increased over time. So motherhood today has more negative effects on uh, labor market participation probability of women than it used to have about 15 years ago. Uh, we then analyzed some uh, measures that could be taken to improve labor market participation. Uh, I'm going to give a highlight here on the childcare provision as it relates to labor market participation of women and mothers in particular. Uh, what we did first in the report is we analyzed what would happen if the new Barcelona targets uh, for participation in childcare for the youngest children were reached. So just to remind you, the target is 45% of the youngest children to participate in childcare. So what would happen if this, these were reached in three countries, in Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And you see the effects uh, in the dark blue bars in the chart, and you see that the effects are quite sizable, in, particularly in Austria and Hungary. Uh, there, the effect would be more than a 15 percentage point boost to labor market participation of, of mothers. Uh, in Italy, there are more, more modest effects, but they are still positive. The other thing that we did, so there is a variety of ways in which you can uh, increase childcare participation. What I want to highlight from the report is, is, is a bit of a novel analysis that we carried out with colleagues from OACD, uh, because there we looked at uh, what we called the geographical accessibility of childcare, which basically means we calculated, uh, we calculated the time needed to reach the nearest provider of childcare in a number of small EU regions in several countries where we could collect data on this, and you can see this in these maps over there on the, on the slide. I think the key takeaway from this analysis is that when it comes to immediate access, there, are, there is a potential for improvement. So in most small regions in the EU, between 40 to 60 percent of the uh, population can reach and, uh, the closest childcare provider within a 15-minute walk. The others can't. Uh, the situation is much better for driving, but in light of the green transition and sustainability concerns, that might not be the, the preferred mode, mode of transport here. Uh, uh, now, I want to spend a bit of time uh, on the fact that even, even if we improve labor market participation of women, uh, I mean, this will help with some shortages, but it's unlikely to be a panacea. Uh, this is because EU labor market is gender segregated, that is, most jobs are carried out either predominantly by men or predominantly by women. And the same holds for the shortage occupations that we identified in the report. So you can see in the slide over here that there is a number of occupations 
uh, which are dominated by men. Uh, and for these occupations, if you improve labor market participation women, unless something changes, it might, it, might not do that, it might not do that much to fill these positions. Interestingly, on the other side of the chart, so the chart gives you actually the percentage of women in each of the occupational groups. I forgot to say that. Um, on the other side of the chart, you can see that there are certain occupations where uh, women dominate, such as personal care workers, cleaners, or nursing professionals. Uh, but they are still in shortage. Um, this could be a bit of a surprising, but not really. And this is because in the report, we argue that gender segregation contributes to labor shortages regardless of whether the occupation is male or, or female dominated. It contributes to labor shortages because it artificially limits the pool of available people that can, uh, that can carry out the given post uh, to effectively mostly one gender. Uh, and this, we are, the word artificially is important here uh, because it often does not have to do with some kind of underlying gender differences in abilities or skills. It often has to do with some kind of gender norms or stereotypes that demarcate certain, certain occupations as male, or as male or female. And these stereotypes take hold very early on in, 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 the, very early on in life. Uh, already from early childhood, they are apparent that uh, children get exposed to them and they get influenced by them in their career expectations. I will give an example here. Uh, so, for example, when you look at jobs in information and communication technology, if you look at some relevant skills of young boys and girls, such as performance in maths or science, true, there are still some differences in favor of boys in some EU countries. In other countries, they have disappeared. Where they are, they are relatively modest. But if you look at difference in aspirations, the, differen the, the difference is huge. So, if you look at 15-year-old boys, about one in 10 in the EU currently expects to work in IT occupation. If you look at 15-year girls, it's about one in 100. So the difference is massive in terms of expectations. Now, we wanted to explore this a bit deeply, the, a bit more in depth, the issue of segregation. So we looked at two broad occupational groups that concentrate a lot of shortages. That is healthcare occupations, and that is jobs in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, STEM for short. And we also looked uh, uh, at, a subset, uh, at a subset of STEM jobs, which is the jobs related to information and communication technology. So on this chart, you can see what's the extent of the gender gap in employment in, in, these, uh, in these occupational groups. In blue, you have the proportion of all women who work in these occupations. In green, you have the proportion of all men. And for example, on the chart uh, on healthcare, so the first, the first one on the slide, you can see that there is about 14% uh, percent, uh, of uh, women, of 13, 14 percent of all employed women today work in healthcare occupations. This proportion is about 4% for men, so you have about 10 percentage point gap. For STEM jobs, this is roughly reversed, so the, the, the situation is roughly the opposite. You also see from the slide uh, that the gender gap in employment remains relatively stable over time. What is interesting on the first chart that, uh, that looks at uh, ICT jobs is that the gender gap in employment actually grows and grows relatively fast. In 2011, the gap was two percentage points in favor of men. Currently, it's about four percentage points in favor of men. So we have a grow growing domination here. Uh, the final slide that I'm going to give you, uh, given the time uh, cons considerations, relates to uh, some kind of factors that contribute to gender segregation. So in the report, we looked again at the same occupational groups uh, and uh, analyzed uh, or attempted to decompose the observed gender employment gaps, which I illuminated on the slide before, into the individual components that, co that contribute to them that we could capture through data which is essentially what you see in the free slides over, uh, in the free charts over here, just to give a bit of an explanation. So the first bar in each of these charts, the highest one, gives the overall gender employment gap and decomposes it into a proportion that is explained by factors that we can capture in analysis and the proportion that is unexplained, so we don't really know where it comes from. Uh, the remaining bars in these slides uh, basically take the overall size of the gender pay gap and attribute it to individual factors that we captured by data. Uh, so that's, for example, where women and men work with in terms of sectors or what type of qualifications they hold, uh, both in terms of educational attainment, so level, 
but also in terms of fields of study. I want to quickly highlight two key findings from this analysis. So the first finding, if you look at the first bar in each of the charts, you can see that for healthcare and STEM occupations, we are actually able to explain quite a lot of the, quite a lot of the gender gap, gender employment gap that we observe. So we can roughly attribute it to certain type of uh, a factor that is causing it. The situation is a bit different for ICT jobs, where we explain maybe a half of the gap. The half of the gap, we don't know where it comes from, so there is probably some factors that we can't, can't really capture well in our analysis. The second thing I want to highlight is that the differences in the fields of education uh, that men and women study account for a sizable proportion of the gender employment gaps that we are seeing. So it's about a half in STEM jobs, it's about a third in healthcare, it's about a fourth in uh, ICT jobs. In all of these occupational groups, this is quite a sizable proportion uh, of, uh, of the gender employment gap. And then with this, I want to uh, conclude and highlight the importance of measures to take uh, to tackle gender segregation in, in education. Uh, so the, these measures are not only going to contribute to desegregating the EU labor market, but they're also going to contribute to uh, attracting more people into shortage occupations as we see today in the EU. And that is, I think, an important connection uh, that, is not, uh, you know, uh, that is not that obvious. So I, I just wanted to highlight it here as an ending point. Uh, I think with this, I hand back to Florence. She already said how to look online at the report, so I'm not going to repeat that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora and Jakob, for this uh, very comprehensive analysis. And I know that we could go on for uh, a long time because there are so many very interesting elements in, in that report. Um, and we're now going to build uh, on, on the elements that we've just heard about from our two co-authors um, talking to our panelists. So let me introduce... Uh, the panelists joining us this afternoon. We have next to Nora uh, Barbara Geist Gestenberger, sorry, who's head of unit at the uh, Working Life Unit at Eurofound. Next to her is Elias Livanos, who's expert in skills trends and intelligence at CEDEFOP. Uh, Maud Sake, senior public policy and economic graph manager for LinkedIn. And next to her is Vitauta Spesiukonis, who's research officer at the, uh, for gender equality at the European Institute for Gender Equality. Welcome to you all. And before uh, I dive into some of the questions that I have for you, I would also like to invite all of you to sort of bounce off or raise questions, just you know, indicate that you'd like uh, the floor and if we can generate some more interactive discussion rather than just a Q&A, that would be very nice. So I hope we have the opportunity of doing so. Um, Ilias, I'm, I'm going to start with you because uh, we, we, we talked this morning about some of the difficulties met uh, by, by companies um, in terms of hiring, and I'd like to focus on SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. They often report in the EU about the difficulties they have in hiring staff with the right skills, with relevant skills for their activities. So do you think that such difficulties can be interpreted as a direct evidence of skill so shortages, or do you think that hiring difficulties actually uh, are due to other reasons? Thank you for the question. I think my direct answer to you would be uh, yes, and this is because the small and medium enterprises will be those that they will fill the skill shortage first. On the other hand, the big companies, they're more attractive to uh, candidates, so it, it will be their first choice. And let's think about IT specialists that we often say that they're in shortage. Most of them would want to work for big IT companies, which means that the pool of candidates left for the small and medium enterprises would be way smaller. So that could be a direct uh, impact of a skill shortage. But there could be other reasons as well. It could be frictional problems or labor market and institutional imperfections. For example, small and medium enterprises they're more exposed to inefficiencies of the matching uh, mechanism. And this means that they're less able to advertise their positions and find the suitable candidates. 
Another result, there could be vacancies and unemployment at the same time. In the same way, they're more dependent on institutions, for example, to cover their educational needs, while the big companies will be able to provide in-house uh, training. So, uh, again, the small and medium enterprises, even though it is not directly linked to a skill shortage, they're more exposed to all these inefficiencies of institutions, of labor market imperfections, and this could lead into a skills uh, shortage. Another uh, reason it could be that small and medium enterprises, they're less able to pay more to cover a skill shortage. And to put things into context, in one of the major uh, European Year of Skills events, one uh, highly ranked official from a big tech company said that they're happy to pay their cleaners, their makeup artists, and all sorts of medium and low skilled individuals to the same pay as they do for other members of the staff. So imagine what they would do in order to cover skill shortage. They would just you know, pay more and find the suitable candidates. And this is something that the small and medium enterprises may not be able to do. And also individuals from their side that they're in shortage occupations, they may set a reservation wage, which is the minimum acceptable uh, wage, at such a level that medium and small enterprises, they could not uh, compete. And finally, uh, there could be issues related to working conditions like uh, the physical environment, the level of autonomy, the level of pay, the working hours. We can say that the medium and small enterprises will offer inferior working conditions compared to big companies, uh, of course. So all in all, we can say that uh, the hiring difficulties or skill shortages will be more persistent for small and medium enterprises. Some of these could be directly linked with the skill shortage in the labor market, and some would be less. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara, the, the, the report this year, uh, or the analysis in, uh, in the report, was conducted jointly by DG Employment and uh, Eurofound. And it also used the uh, European Working Conditions Survey uh, carried out by Eurofound. So um, we see from the analysis that certain persistent shortage occupations, such as uh, transport and care, as we've seen uh, in, the, in the presentation, have higher job strain, they have lower pay, and they have less secure contracts, generally speaking. So what kind of underlying factors can explain why some occupations offer poorer working conditions than others? I mean, in some cases it's pretty obvious, but in others it isn't. Uh, thank you, Florence, and uh, thank you for giving Eurofound the opportunity to participate in this panel. When we look at uh, the factors that influence working conditions, uh, occupation and sector come out, turn out to be one of the most important determinants of, of working conditions, and in a way that is, as you said yourself, it's quite intuitive because what you do in your job, the, the kind of tasks that you uh, perform in your job, are, of course, determined by the occupation and the sector you're working in. So if we look at these task profiles, we, we could basically distinguish three different task profiles, the ones that are very much influenced by, by physical routine tasks. That means usually working with a machine, repetitive, standardized tasks. Second profile, cognitive tasks, intellectual tasks, problem solving, characterized by a high use of ICT. And then the third big group, interactional tasks. So these are all the people who work with other people who have clients, pupils, uh, passengers, uh, uh, patients to, to look after. And of course, these different tasks come then with different demands on the worker in, in the workplace. And if we look at our labor uh, shortage occupations, take the examples of, of the building workers. So here the problem is usually very high levels of, of physical risks and demands, lifting heavy loads, uh, uh, uncomfortable positions to work in, uh, cleaners, helpers, you have the physical demands, but then add the exposure to chemicals, for example, for, for cleaners to that, add unsocial hours, work late at night, work uh, uh, during the weekends, etc. Health and care uh, workers, again, physical demands, not necessarily lifting heavy loads, but lifting people. 
and combine that with emotional demands, working with sick people, working all day with people who need care is emotionally uh, draining. Doctors, nurses have one of the highest levels of work intensity, which is another dimension of job quality that uh, uh, is, is important to keep in mind. One other element I want to mention, one other dimension of job quality, prospects. Um, if you look at the group, uh, cooks, waiters, bartenders, but also residential carers, you have a much higher share, above average share, of temporary uh, workers, temporary contract workers in those uh, uh, occupations, which means that job insecurity is a big issue in those occupations. So this is the, that's the negative side that I have highlighted here, the, the, the demand side. Uh, uh, um, Nora, you explained that very well. The demand side uh, of, um, uh, of job uh, quality. If we look at the resources side, so the things that help workers to cope with these demands, that is much less influenced by occupation and sector. That is very much influenced by work organization and the work environment, and that is a company level issue. And, and uh, Ilias, I think that's when, what, when you mentioned uh, different conditions in SMEs compared to big companies, that's exactly where that comes in, the work organization, the work environment. So it's important to understand that if we look at, at something like high emotion, uh, emotion uh, emotional demands in this area of uh, uh, the social environment, there is a resource side to that as well. Social support by colleagues, by your uh, boss, can balance this out to a degree. Because of time, I'm not going to give you more examples, but it is important to remember that we have these different dimensions of job quality and that it is not only about pay but it is, of course, also about pay. And again, as Nora already uh, pointed out, for many of these shortest occupations, uh, we see that pay is not adequate, and that leads to this high share of people reporting, having difficulties, making ends meet at the end of the month, and that's the case for carers and cleaners and cooks, bartenders, etc. Final point on this question, what explains the differences? Let's not underestimate the role of collective bargaining, which influences working conditions enormously. Pay, of course, but also working time, training, etc. So the question, is collective bargaining in this sector, at sectoral level, present, how good is the coverage, has a big influence on working conditions in that sector. Thank you. Um, Maud, I'd, I'd like to, to highlight something that you do at LinkedIn. The, the review that we've just uh, had an overview of shows that inefficient recruitment and human resources practices are really amongst the uh, drivers of, of persistent labor shortages. The latest LinkedIn Skills First report shows that the industry that are struggling to hire uh, workers could increase their talent pool by up to 20 times if they used a skills-first approach. So what is a skills-first approach? What do you mean by that? And, and also, what are the sectors where this practice is really successful? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. I think um, maybe let, let me take a very small step back to explain how we come up, I think, with those, uh, with those insights and, and why, actually. Um, so you, you may all know LinkedIn as an online platform. We um, connect uh, over 1 billion professional worldwide today. This is a milestone we hit at the beginning of November, and we're part of an online ecosystem that is helping people find jobs and build uh, the connection and the skills that they may need to further their career. And so through the platform, we can um, identify trends and insights about what is happening on the labor market through um, anonymizing and aggregating the data that we, that we have. And so we publish regularly reports online um, according to a few research work streams. 
um, uh, one on the green economy, on gender gap in particular, and I was just listening to the presentation earlier, and we just published some insight about um, women in STEM, actually, over the summer, that was really showing that uh, you, you, fo you found women um, in university on those topics, but the biggest gap was just after university, between when they leave university and when they come into the first job, and that's really where we saw it, and I think the explanation is not super clear. Some of the factors you highlighted definitely, but we're wondering if we're not missing something there as well. So. That's all we do, we publish it, and we also look, we've been looking for a while at what we call skills first. And for us, this is the recruitment strategy of focusing on a candidate skills and abilities to do the job, uh, whether or not they meet the typical education requirement or previous job requirement. We're not saying that we should ignore, obviously, your education requirement or you know, your, your previous work experience, but we're encouraging, I think, recruiters to look first, maybe, at the skills and ability of the candidate. Uh, we've been advocating for this approach for a while now because of maybe two main factors that we have identified and that are well known in any case. Uh, the fact that skills needed for a given position keep changing. We've mentioned that many times over the past two days. There's been many different numbers, I think, thrown around on that topic. Let me add another one. Uh, we published um, very pre preliminary research on the impact of generative AI on the workforce over the summer. And based on that research, we could see that um, skills required for jobs might change by 65% due to AI by 2030. So just maybe looking at skills first is perhaps a way for company to um, um, keep maybe in, in, in phase with the progression and with those changes. And the second factor was that we've all known that the labor market is opaque, it's inefficient, it's unequal, but that those trends we think are even exacerbated today by the declining in, uh, I mean, more aging population, by the uh, technological shift, and also by the shifting goals and aspiration of the workforce. So I think that's what led us to do this research, to advocate for this approach. And the research we published uh, in the spring um, so show that talent pools expand nearly, so 10 times, sorry, not 20. Um, that uh, 20 would be amazing, but for 10 is already quite good. Um, so that explains um, 10 times uh, talent pool globally if you use this approach. Obviously, there are differences according to region and country. If you look at the EU, on average, that would be a factor of six times, and we see differences for country. That would be uh, up to 11 times in Spain and 10 in France, but up to six in Ireland and three in Luxembourg. So it depends, obviously, on the market and the industry that are most present there. And just to conclude on the industry where this works well, um, all of the sectors that we have reviewed in the report, and it's quite a large number of them, we see a significant increase in that talent pool in any case. But the sector we see where that works the best would be the consumer services, retail, and administrative and support services. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, just a very quick reaction, and I think it will lead to a direct bridge to without, what without us is going to say. When you were talking about the STEM transition from the universities into jobs, I just wanted to highlight, we highlighted the role of education, but obviously gender segregation, and this also ties into what Barbara was saying, affects working conditions quite a lot. Uh, for example, in this case, availability of uh, certain kind of work-life balance solutions across different sectors. But I think I won't talk about this anymore because I'm sure Vitautas yeah. is going to pick that up. So uh, just a quick <laughs> bridge. Indeed, Vitautas. Um, so yes, we have already picked on the, on the issue of uh, gender segregation. And uh, it is part of the uh, uh, persistent uh, labor shortages drivers. Uh, in the EU labor market. So based on your research uh, at the Gender Equality uh, Institute, what are the root causes behind this gen gender segregation and, and how do they contribute to labor and skill shortages? Uh, thank you, thank you very much for the question and thank you for the invitation uh, for having Kaige in this panel. And also, con congratulations for colleagues and the Commission for producing this really excellent uh, and highly relevant um, report. So, talking about gender segregation in the labor market, 
indeed, it's a, it's a complex, a complex issue, and I would say highly resistant to change. Uh, I think Jakob also shown in, in the slides uh, a time series, but we also at the Institute, we have gender equality index, which measures gender equality in the different areas of life. And one of that area is work. And we also have indicator on gender segregation. And actually we see that during the last 10 years, the station essentially hasn't changed. It remains the same. Um, I mean, we see some minor positive signs in the STEM sector. I think it's also as visible in the slides. I mean, the share of women in this sector is slightly increasing, even though the, the share of men, as you, as you saw, increasing even more, so the gap still increases. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, I, I'm also very happy, but uh, in the report, we also touched the sector of um, education, health, and social services, because quite often this sector somehow remains a bit uh, forgotten in the analysis. And, and we see also a major, major gender segregation in, 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 in this sector. And here is completely no change. I mean, nothing, nothing is happening, and, and it, it is very likely that the station it's only will get worse with aging, aging societies and, in, and with uh, climate impact. It's because it's likely that we'll need more of uh, formal care, care services. Uh, so about uh, the reasons of gender segregation, I think you cannot speak about uh, gender segregation in the labor market without touching uh, gender segregation in education. Because indeed it goes hand in hand, it's essentially uh, different sides of, of the same coin. And when we speak about uh, gender segregation and education, uh, obviously stereotypes comes, comes into play. I think uh, they were mentioned quite, quite a number of times already uh, in the forum and also Jakob touched a bit. Uh, because indeed if some professions or some occupations are seen are more are more suitable for one of the genders, so I think it also has an impact on, on, the, on the choose of the potential study, study fields and, and potential uh, occupations. Um, and here, uh, I think it's not only important to, to speak about uh, what kind of stereotypes might uh, personally have which uh, making that decision about the study fields or maybe occupation, but also about uh, broader, um, let's say, um, surroundings. Um, I, I have in mind here relatives, uh, teachers, even the professional career uh, counselors, which might have quite a significant impact on, on the deci decision made. It's also important, I think, with the policies also to target uh, a broader audience when we speak about uh, stereotypes. And indeed, the second point that I would like to mention is, uh, as Jakub gave a very nice introduction, is uh, work-life balance uh, policies, uh, flexible working arrangements because it's of high importance um, um, for uh, women, men, especially women, because the reality is on our side is with still women, takes the most part of the unpaid care and housework activities. I mean, um, they're important because they help them to, com uh, to combine those care and responsibilities uh, with participation in, in the labor market. And different sectors vary in the, in the provision of flexible working arrangements and, uh, and work-life balance policies. And, um, in connection to this, we also need to see availability of the formal care services, because if the formal care services are not available, um, um, then a woman tend to choose um, uh, either they, they don't participate in the labor market at all, or they tend to choose such uh, occupation sectors which provide a bit higher flexibility or allow opportunities to work part-time, which then has uh, broader implications in the future with the pay gap, uh, pension gap, um, and our, our issues. So, and maybe the last point, how it links with the skill shortages. Um, um, I, I fully agree with, uh, with uh, the point that Jakob made, essentially just limits the pool of people from, from, from where you can recruit. So if essentially, if in certain sectors, just half of the population participates, I mean, it's almost by default, but you will have some issues with, with, uh, with skills provision. Thanks. Thank you. Um, would any of you like to maybe comment or, or, or remark or ask a question from one of the other speakers at this stage? Not now? That's okay. We can, we can continue. Um, and, and I'd like to um, build on a bit further uh, some of the remarks uh, that have already been made and turn to you, Barbara. If, uh, if we look at the work of uh, Eurofound, what kind of initiatives or measures do you think uh, we could uh, expect or ask from policymakers in order to take 
some of these occupations and make them more attractive uh, by improving, for instance, the working conditions? Yeah, the, the nice thing about working conditions or job quality is the fact, as I have pointed out before, that it is multidimensional, that we have so many screws we can turn, levers that we can um, use in order to improve it. Be because, you know, we could look at the physical environment, at the social environment, at the working time aspects, at the uh, work intensity aspects. So this long list of, of different dimensions of job quality, and for all of those, there are possibilities to improve. So that's good. It's a pain for conducting a working condition survey because you have to have a long, long list of questions in order to uh, examine all these dimensions. But for policy action, it's actually a very positive thing. Now, the other thing to, to remember is that, of course, we have different levels on which we can act. There's the possibility uh, to act through, through legislation. Uh, and, and for the big issues, uh, protection of workers' health and safety, uh, levels of uh, maximum for working time, uh, equal treatment, etc., that's something that where legislation, I would argue, works best, and where, of course, the European uh, level legislation plays a big role, which is then transposed into national level legislation or is taken up by social partners in collective bargaining at sectoral level. But for improving working conditions, the company level is really where it happens. Because, as I said before, work organization, the work environment that you create in the company, that is what influences um, working conditions uh, enormously. So for policymakers to encourage the dialogue at company level, uh, is important to raise, help raise awareness for this very, very clear link between working conditions, job quality, and outcomes like health and well-being of workers, but also engagement, uh, trust, um, work-life balance, ultimately also productivity. To, so to emphasize that this link exa ex uh, exists and to encourage companies to take that into account and encourage the actors at the company level to act upon this, I think, is, is, is very important. And then the second thing that I think, we again, we cannot on, uh, ignore is the pay issue. So adequate pay is a prerequisite for attracting workers to some of these shortage, uh, sh shortage occupations uh, because they have such a high share of low-wage earners. And that, I would argue, is where, where the minimum wage directive uh, plays such an important role for two reasons. One, of course, because it will help to improve uh, wage floors. And again, in many of these shortage occupations, we have uh, a high share of workers at or around the minimum wage. But also because the minimum wage directive aims to increase collective bargaining coverage. And again, collective bargaining leads to better working conditions, very, very clearly. So these two points at this stage. Thank you. Um, Vitotas, to continue on the issue of uh, possible policies that uh, could be generated, um, in the ICT sector in particular, and we've seen it from Jakub's presentation, gender segregation contributes to really persistent uh, labor shortages in many occupations. And that also touches upon the issue of education that you mentioned earlier. So what do you think um, key policies could be in order to promote a more equal representation of women in ICT in particular? Mm, yeah, thanks for the question. Well, I think IC sector has been on policy agenda for a while. Um, and, and let's say a, a set of measures uh, which can be potentially applied is also, uh, I think it's, it's quite known. So, so, and broadly speaking, I think they can be grouped in the, into the three, three groups. So the first one would be um, the policies which aims to tackle indeed um, gender stereotypes. And I think quite a few also policy actions were taken at EU level uh, in recent years, also national level, uh, targeting the general population, maybe more specific groups. And um, yeah, so, so that would be, be one, of, one of the group. Uh, second one would be improvement of skills, uh, definitely in ICT field. 
Uh, and again, I think um, um, European Commission uh, in the digital skills agenda also have a few relevant initiatives in this field, also quite a lot of happening at the national level with governments, uh, NGOs, um, or even private companies offering some training opportunities and some of these uh, trainings are even specifically are focused uh, on women. Um, also, we have active labor market uh, policies provided by, by, by the governments. So I think quite, quite a few developments happening in this field. Um, uh, but, but of course, it's a question whether it's, it's, it's sufficient um, and uh, whether we'll see a more substantial change in, in, in this ICT sector in the, in, the coming, in the coming years. Somehow, I'm a bit optimistic. I, I mean, I, I believe that we'll have a balance in the sector, but at least that we'll see a higher share of women in the coming years, somehow a bit, a bit uh, more optimistic. And maybe uh, as a third uh, set of policies, um, this also connects my previous point, which I mentioned. It's about uh, work life balance provision and uh, flexible working uh, conditions, which would be really a game changer, a game changer for, um, for, many, for many women and men, especially women, uh, uh, which aims to combine family responsibilities with, uh, with participation in the, in, in the labor market. Um, but as I said, um, ICT, ICT sector has been I would say on the policy spot for, for a while. And here I would like to also maybe touch um, uh, another sector, uh, and I'm getting back again to education, health and social services. Um, because I think if you want to really have a gender balanced economy, we also have to think how to increase uh, gender representation in this sector as well. And I think a question how to bring more men into this sector is much more difficult uh, because um, uh, was also, as mentioned in the, in the presentation by colleagues, the working conditions are quite difficult in, in those sectors. Uh, they you, you also usually are not so well paid. So how to bring uh, more men, which on average, you know, earn more than women in the labor market? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question. Probably the first step uh, towards this direction would be um, to acknowledge uh, the value of unpaid um, care work and also uh, professional uh, care work. Um, uh, I mean, in our societies, but also, also, also financially. So that would be my input. Thank you, um, Ilias. Based on on the work done by CDFOP and and in particular uh, the future shortage indicator, and if we bear in mind the twin transition, which ha we have not yet really touched upon in this discussion, what would be your three key messages uh, to uh, policy makers and maybe to the audience as well uh, in terms of future skills shortages. What would you like to highlight? Thank you. So I think the first message would come from the, uh, from the demand side and clearly say get ready for the twin transitions. Uh, for instance, we see that uh, occupations related to the ICT sector, like information and communication technology professionals, they're expected to grow in a very fast pace until 2035. And this could bring about skill shortages. And the same could be for science and engineering professionals, which are linked to the, sup to the supply chain of the Green Deal. In other words, we need them in order to uh, deploy the Green Deal. So I think this is an important uh, message because they, uh, these occupations, they grow in a way faster pace than the rest of occupations, and we need to take this into uh, account. On the other hand, we see some other occupations, uh, for example, uh, keyboard operat operators and clerks, that they are linked to the deployment of the digitalization, their demand will be declining. Of course, everybody has these uh, skills nowadays, so we do not depend on these specific um, professionals, uh, these operators. And the same could be, of course, for the introduction of robots at the workplace, as there could be uh, displacement of workers. So the first message would be scan the needs of the future, of course, and then get prepared for what is coming. The second message, which I think is quite important and uh, very often overlooked, is uh, it's coming from the supply side. And we know and we say that Europe is aging uh, very fast. For instance, we know that by 2035, almost all baby boomers will have uh, retired. 
but the replacement and the retirement rates will be stronger for some occupations like the others than others. And uh, now I would like to highlight two cases. The one is health professionals, and the other one is personal care workers. So not only will we need more people from these groups because Europe is aiding, so we need to take care of other people, but these groups, they're old groups in terms of age structure, so we need to replace many of them. But think about health professionals. They require a lot of time to study. It's difficult. You need to convince people to take the studies. You need specific infrastructure. The same with care workers. Because of the nature of the work, they need some specific social skills that is difficult to develop through the educational system or the training system. So uh, the main point would be you know, check the replacement needs and the replacement rates because you may find yourself in a situation that skill shortages will be coming from specific sectors and occupations that are actually, actually surprising and you wouldn't anticipate. Now, the third point comes from uh, imbalances, which is different to shortages because it looks at the level of education. In other words, what the demand would need and what the supply would uh, provide. And when we look into the future, we see that the supply for high skills will meet the demand, which is a very important message that will have the high skills needed. But what we observe is that even though there is no imbalance at the high level of skills, when the skill requirement starts to go down, then the, the imbalances, they're very strong. And for example, even though there is no imbalance for, highly, uh, for health professionals, for instance, the imbalance for health associate professionals would be quite strong. Would this mean that we'll have a shortage for uh, health associate professionals like nurses, for example? Probably it's not a skill shortage, but we saw because of the working conditions, because of the environment, may, many health associate professionals may be scared away from this group and may seek employer somewhere else. Or it could even be the case some health professionals, because themselves they face some you know, difficulties, they may not want to take up the challenge. And because nowadays the workplace and the requirements at work has been broadened, they may be happy to take up the duties of uh, a nurse or like uh, an uh, engineer may be happy to take the duties of a technician. And this comes to the working condition that has been very well covered by my colleague from Eurofound. Um, and of course, it could be uh, the case that the, uh, the content of some highly skilled occupations is not uh, appealing anymore. We talked about the working conditions, but there could be uh, other conditions like the level of responsibility that scares uh, people away from what they have uh, studied. So uh, the message which has been repeatedly presented today is that it is not just about skill shortages. It is more than that. And we need to pay attention to them because troubles may be coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Maud, um, maybe not directly, but somehow in, in relation to the imbalances between supply and demand, um, you presented your skills first project, but how, uh, more generally, how can firms improve their recruitment practices uh, to target skills shortages? Um, and what would be, in your view, the best practices that they could, uh, that they could apply? Uh, could they use AI, for instance? I think, um, so going back to your approach, I think this is the basis on which company can build to uh, at, at least start addressing some of those shortages. I think we've seen, as discussed just now, that not everything can be addressed, maybe with a skills first approach, especially in industry where you need a specific certification or, or where working condition you know, are too hard and scare away uh, people. But I think one of the recommendations we would give is really for employer to map the skills that are needed for the job for which they are hiring to really identify this and to focus, uh, to focus on those skills in their, 
in their uh, job description and, and, and their, recruitment, uh, their recruitment efforts. Um, also really review, I think, their, their job description and really include only the, I would say, certification or experience or degree that are really necessary um, to do it. Because I think we, we all know those, uh, I would say, job description that includes I don't know, 20 different things, you know, like a never ending wish list that you see from the employers that only a unicorn can actually meet. And we know people actually react differently uh, to those things. It's very well known in particular that uh, women will often only apply if they meet, let's say, 90% of those criteria whereas men would perhaps apply if they met 40 or 50% of them. So that's really like a, maybe a concrete thing that, that, we, that we often advocate. And, and, and we keep perhaps banging a bit <laughs> uh, away with, with that skills first approach because in that same study that we published in the spring, we really see that this approach helps actually um, in particular women and younger worker and worker without a degree. Um, if I take only the, the gender gap um, issue that we have talked um, today quite a lot about, we see that that's a global start, but basically we see in jobs where women are underrepresented. If you take a skills first approach, of course that benefits also to men. I mean, the talent pool of men is increased, but the talent pool of women increased 24% more than, than the one for men. So you really see the difference, and you can see similar trends when you're looking uh, at younger worker or when you're looking at, at worker without a degree. Um, and maybe you can offer... Um, a bit of a hopeful message on that. We, we see that companies are starting to look at this approach a bit more closely. We see that over the past year, a bit less than half of the recruiters that are active on LinkedIn are actually using skills data to try to find uh, you know, can potential candidates for, for, for their opening. And um, same thing over the past year, we see that globally, uh, uh, LinkedIn members have added 380 million skills to their profiles. So you can really see that starting and that we hope to see that grow. Um, and maybe to, to address your final point on AI, um, sure, just depends a bit how, when, and, and, and which tool you use. Um, speaking only for LinkedIn, obviously, we, we believe that AI can really bring, um, well, enormous you know, or at least expand access to opportunity uh, in the labor market. At, on a platform perspective, as I said, we have one billion members, we have 70 million businesses, we have 15 million jobs opening on the platform at any given time. Without AI, we just can't make it work. We can't serve content, we can't serve job recommendations. So, uh, and then we know that we provide economic opportunity on the platform through those services, so, so it's definitely key. But as we've been discussing over the past couple of days, it needs to be done responsibly, it needs to be done transparently, and, and not seen, you know, and, and I would say in, in a way that makes sense for both employers and for workers as well. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions from the room. So do we have already at least one question from the room? I mean, I have one online, but, you know. Yes, please. Okay, so we have two questions over there. Yes, we have somebody bringing you a mic. Thank you so much. Uh, Sara Seki from Don Bosco International that worldwide benefits almost one million of learners uh, with schools and vet centers in 135 countries. Um, my question is like, education was mentioned a lot, but at a European level, we need to rely on national policies on education. So it's like there is any strategy to um, make governments more aware of the change it's needed, especially concerning gender bias and gender segregation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe we can also link that to the issue of vocational education and training, which is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the leading uh, issues that the EU is working on. So maybe, Ilias, would you like take that, to take that question? Yes, that's... Uh a very timely uh, question, of course. We saw that uh, the, uh, the fields of study, it's one of the 
key issues that can explain uh, the employment gap between the, the genders. Um, it is a structural issue, of course. Uh, each member state has to develop their own policies under the uh, umbrella of the EU, of course. What we need, we need uh, what we call at SEDEFOP skills intelligence. We need to know what are the demands uh, of the companies, what are the demands of the economy, what are the trends of the future, and be prepared for it. And we need to be in a position that we're uh, flexible to adjust the way the, uh, the educational providers operate. Uh, it is true that some countries, they're way faster than other countries. Of course, I don't think we can force the countries to take uh, specific uh, steps. But what we can do, we can make available all the intelligence that we have, so at least we can point them towards the right direction. Thank you. Yes, I please. Can, I can also just briefly add, I think in terms of the specific initiatives, uh, it may be, uh, I think it's good to have a look at the gender equality strategy of the EU, where there is a point on tackling gender stereotypes, and you have some, uh, you have some initiatives outlined there uh, of what you can do exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Was the second question related to education or not? To gender? Okay, so please, yeah, take it now, and then we'll take the online question. Thank you very much. Thank you for your insightful and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I am Joanna from EVTA, and today uh, you talked about gender segregation as one of the main driver of labor shortage. I would like to know, when you talk about the gender segregation, why it is approached in binary terms? Isn't this contradicting to the union of quality, equality principles? Because to my knowledge, we don't live in a binary world, so we don't have only women and men, but gender is lived also through other forms of expressions. And uh, secondly, um, how we can effectively tackle the systemic and structural barriers that women face regarding participation and access in the labor market. And here I would like uh, to uh, clarify that women are not in homogeneous category. The situation of a white middle class woman might be very different from a situation of a trans, differently abled Roma. So how we can incorporate an intersexual perspective in European policies that regard not only education but also employment. Thank you very much. Who would like to answer? Uh, maybe uh, I, can, I, can, I can start yes. and maybe ours will contribute. Um, I mean, in our research and our analysis, uh, we take into account all women and men and all the diversity. Um, but uh, the problem that we have with official statistics, what usually statistics are based on sex category, and um, we have to use what is what essentially is available. So I think uh, um, this is also maybe one of the reasons why we mostly speak about one man because essentially just statistics about um, our categories are not are not available. But of course, it's been possible if, if, through qualitative research. Uh, we always uh, always try to take take into account. And the point about international perspective, absolutely, it's, it's of critical importance. And when we analyze gender segregation, we also have to look at different intersections, age, um, education, but, uh, but migrant status, um, uh, family type, and et cetera. So that's absolutely of paramount importance. Thank you. Anybody else would like to pick up on that particular Maybe question? Maybe I would just Please? add something that uh, when we present research findings, of course, it is a simplification of the reality, and this is something we have to come to, uh, to terms with it, because um, let's say there's a gender equality index, there are many indexes that they present the overall picture, but as I said, this is only a simplification of, uh, of reality. But I think that the, uh, the unexplained part that was well uh, presented by my colleague could capture these sort of uh, differences. So even though it was not explicitly stated, it refers to issues that cannot be explained but by what we can capture with our analysis and our data. And as we saw, uh, it is actually quite present. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. just, just a very brief clarification on this. So when you saw, for example, uh, the, the decomposition of the, of the gender employment gap, we did cover a range of uh, 
individual and, uh, and uh, job characteristics in there. So I focused, for the sake of brevity here, only on the role of educational segregation, but uh, we also covered things like age, educational attainment, etc. So there was a range of things covered, but then, yeah, on, on the binary question, the problem is that in the large EU surveys, you don't, you don't have questions to distinguish otherwise. So, uh, it, uh, or maybe in some, but not in the ones that we need for these kind of labor market decomposition, sadly. So there are some surveys that are out there that, that do capture these differences, and you can then look at certain type of things. But if you look at large sample survey for labor market analysis, you would typically have men or women, and then you can do some further disaggregation by things that are usually covered, which is like age, education level, etc. Uh, not not all of them. For, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, ethnicity is typically is is often not covered in these surveys. You would you would have something like country of origin as a proxy or something, but the limitations here are uh, severe. To, uh, and another point is that what I presented here and what we did in the report is more of a high level. Uh, quantitative analysis. I think if you want to look at intersectional perspective of, from uh, a very particular angle and very particular, um, uh, very particular group, ethnographic studies or qualitative studies uh, are, are much, more, much more useful because they kind of illustrate the diversity of experiences uh, much better than, than what this type of quantitative analysis would do. So I think there it's important to look at this type of at this type of evidence, which uh, sadly here we didn't didn't have the time time to uh, present. Maud, yes, just to add one point, I think the same thing. We're all a bit limited, but what we can gather from the data and what we can at least uh, pretty confidently say um, that it shows um, uh, we're looking at men and women as well on our data because we try to inf infer that based on the first name of our members, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's basically the, that's basically the system we have. There's some country we can't really cover because our tools are not sure, you know, if, if that's a female name or a male name sometimes. So that's, that's I think, the, the type of things that we may, that we may be just practically fair, that we have to face with a bit every day. We just try, I think, every year to try to find a new sector or a new category or age of experience of women that we can try and look, to try, uh, look at to try to build a, a, as broad a picture as we can. Thank you. I'd like to take a question that we have received online. How can lifelong learning and the acquisition of digital skills be more actively promoted to workers who have been unfamiliar with those so far? Um, maybe Barbara? I can give it a shot. Yes. <laughs> um, Trying to answer that question, maybe I'm going to start by picking up on something that uh, our colleague from LinkedIn said about the, the mapping of skills in companies. Uh, we have a question in the working conditions survey, it was not included in 21, it will be back in 2024 in the next round, where we ask, for your current job, do you have the right level of skills? Second option, do you need more training in order to uh, um, do your job well? Or do you have skills that would allow you to take on higher level responsibilities? And I think, if I remember correctly, it's around a quarter of respondents who say, I would have the skills to do more. I would have the skills for higher level responsibilities. Okay, this is self-assessed and uh, it's just an indication. But I think this mapping of what do we have, what can we build on, is a first very important step. Then also for encouraging uptake of training, using the skills, building on the, using, using the skills that are already available, building on this, uh, I think that, that is a very important part of company-level policies that encourage continuous uh, uh, education and training and, and acquiring of, of new skills. Thank you. Yes, we have another question here. Thank you. Just a second, sorry. Um, we need the mic so that interpreters <laughs> can hear you. It's a, big, it's a big room. Thank you very much. I'm Isabel Martín del Peral from the European Commission. And I would like to ask uh, the speaker from LinkedIn about a very specific comment she has made and which I have experienced in uh, 
in recruiting and in mentoring, and that is the fact that women will only apply if they meet 90%, let's say 90, could be 80, percent of the requirements, whereas men would apply if they meet 40 percent. This is something I thought was my experience, because I have actually seen it in life on several occasions. And I was wondering, uh, you have mentioned, I think, uh, one, uh, one idea, which is not to require so many uh, things. I, and my question would be for you and for anybody else who would like to intervene, how can we overcome that? Because if women don't apply, clearly this, this segregation won't, uh, won't end. And it, as I say, I've seen it uh, personally and I've encouraged people to go for jobs and so on, women to go for jobs and oh, I don't really meet. I, I think it results from the stereotypes, uh, the fact that women are sometimes unconsciously don't feel they are, you know, up to the standard required for a men environment. And uh, how can we overcome that? Thank you. No. Thank you. I think I, I have seen it as well, I think, in, in many friends or sectors, same thing. We all have the same reflex. With, oh, well, I'm not meeting all of those criteria, so I'm not applying, there's no point. I've seen company try to do the complete opposite, like not listing any requirement, not even the level of seniority that they're looking uh, in their job description. Um, I honestly don't know if that works well. I have never seen any study you know, showing the impact of those types of job description. I can only describe the impact it had on me and, 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 and the people I work with, which were like, well, actually, we're not sure what you want, so we're not applying either, because maybe the level is too junior or too senior. When I read it, I don't know what you want, so, so, so in the end, it, it doesn't encourage you to apply as well. Um, I don't have a number in mind, unfortunately. I uh, just know that in the study we published uh, in the spring, we've actually seen some encouraging sign when we see employer really listing the skills that they're looking for. Um, because that it's a bit more concrete, and, and we've seen a number where we see women actually applying more based on this, because then they can perhaps more accurately assess themselves compared to that. So I don't have a number in mind, but it's, it's in our paper, and uh, that's at least one direction we've seen that seems promising. Jakob. Uh, also, I, I think you really need to think about the settings for recruitment. I'm going to give a little bit of a different example, but I think it relates to this very well. So there is also some evidence that say women and men may negotiate differently for pay, uh, and that this somehow contributes to, to pay gap. But I think just recently I've read a study that did some kind of different treatments of women and men and trying different settings, whether this occurs in all settings. So it did occur if you had some kind of hiring process where you just put uh, some kind of uh, salary uh, and didn't say that it's negotiable explicitly. In this case, men negotiated much more and they got higher salary. Now, if the offer was structured in a different way, saying salary is negotiable explicitly, this difference disappeared. So in, the, in a way of how you structure the setting, the hiring setting might have a big role on these differences that you, that you observe. And it might be quite small things that you have in some type of uh, you know, uh, hiring document, vacancy notice or something that might trigger different patterns of behavior. So in, in some ways, this is important to think about as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please, Barbara if I'm not stopping people from asking uh, questions. Uh, that's very interesting, uh, Jakob. I did, not, uh, I did not know that. Um, but I also wanted to come back to this question of the, of the gender segregation and what we can do about it. Uh, last Wednesday, 15th of November, was Equal Pay Day, so the day when women stopped earning, uh, in theory, because of the 12.7% gender pay gap. What we also need to look at, and that has to do very much with, with working conditions, is working time, time spent at paid work, time spent with unpaid work, where you see this huge gap, um, men working more hours in paid work, but then working a lot less hours in, uh, for unpaid work, so taking care of children, uh, elderly relatives, housework, uh, etc. So it seems that this wish, need, I don't know how to, uh, uh, to, to word it, uh, to combine 
paid work with unpaid work tasks will also influence the choice of women for specific sectors, for specific occupations. Uh, take as the example the overrepresentation of women in public services. Why is that? Because part time is an option, uh, working time is very regulated, no late hours, no late meetings, etc. Much more likely in that setting than in a private se uh, sector setting. So I think addressing this uh, unequal division of work, paid and unwork, uh, unpaid work between men and women is another element that we need to look at uh, when it comes to gender segregation. May I add one more last thing? Again, working conditions, working time. Um, in the survey, in the European Working Conditions Survey, we see that 43% um, of workers would like to work less. And of course, if they work very long hours, that, that uh, share is even higher. But even for the ones who work the normal 35 to 40 hour week, four out of 10 say, if we could, we would like to work less. And men say so more often than women. So we have an issue here with a wish to spend less hours in paid work. Now you could argue, if we already face labor shortages, that's the wrong way to go, to reduce the hours. But you can also argue by reducing the hours, by offering what workers want, more people would join the labor market and engage in employment. So it could actually balance out. I think that's also an important part or an important thought when we are thinking which uh, types, which kind of working conditions should we look at and improve. Okay, I think I saw another hand raised. Yes, please. And if you can make your question short and the answer short, please. Okay, she asked me to stand up. <laughs> I just wanted to compliment <laughs> what uh, she said. Um, the same thing happens not only for women, but, uh, sorry, we provide uh, job coaching services for public employment services. And we find that not only women, but also in other underrepresented uh, groups, like, for instance, people with migration background, they self-exclude themselves if they don't fulfill almost 100% of what is required, and especially, at least in Belgium, regarding languages. So our role, but we cannot uh, do everything, but our part of our role is to convince them that they should, in any case, apply, and to convince the employers that they have many other strengths that, we, that would counteract that. But it's a long uh, work that we had ahead, but... Uh, I just wanted to compliment that because it's not only for women, but of course, we need to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that would be a, a very interesting concluding uh, sentence, concluding point that we can build on. So thank you very much to all our panelists uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for being with us. Stay in the room because in a few minutes we're going to have the closing remarks uh, by Andriana Sukova, Deputy Director General. So please stay with us. Stay with us if you are online as well. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for this very interesting discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.